Hello and welcome to our live stream. My name is Will Hayward, the Acting Political Editor at Wales Online, and I'm joined by the First Minister, Mark Drakeford. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure, Will. Nice to be with you. So yesterday we asked Wales Online readers for questions they'd like us to put to the First Minister, and we had over 3,000 responses. I'm really sorry, we're not going to be able to get through all of them, but we've collated the most common ones and we're going to try and through, uh, whiz through as many as we can now. Uh, so if you don't mind, First Minister, we'll crack on. Lovely. Um, uh, the place we have to start, this came from Linda Cunningham, Deborah Morris, uh, Louise Baker, among many, many others. And it was around the ban on non-essential goods sales in supermarkets. Were you surprised by the public's reaction to the ban? And if you could go back a week, what would you have done differently? I probably was taken a bit by surprise by the strength of reaction uh, because I thought that what we were doing... Uh, was communicated enough to people for people to uh, see that in a public health emergency in which we were asking everybody to stay at home as much as possible, to only leave home when you really needed to, that not going shopping for goods that weren't essential that you didn't need there and then, uh, that that would have been uh, part of the way in which we'd communicated it to everybody. Now, clearly, you know, that, that didn't turn out to be the case. And if I were to go back uh, a week, then I think the number of things we would have done differently, we would have uh, worked a bit more closely with the supermarkets themselves. And we would have perhaps avoided some of the uh, just mistaken communication that led to places thinking that things couldn't be sold when, in fact, uh, they could. Uh, that we would have just worked a bit harder to have explained directly to people that this would mean that while you could go out shopping for the things you needed, the essential goods, that this wasn't the fortnight to be going out and just sort of browsing in, in shops because the more people we meet, the more coronavirus likes it. So I think there were things we could have done to prepare it all better. The basic decision uh, to have a fortnight where we really, really bear down on everything that we would normally be doing in order to create this firebreak that will turn back the tide of coronavirus, that is something that I wouldn't change. Okay, I'm going to move on from that because we've got so many questions. So um, Mark Kent was among many people who asked about the plan after the firebreak. Will some areas be going back into a form of local lockdown? Will there be Wales-wide measures? And could we possibly be seeing a tier system like we have in England? Well, at the moment, well, I think our planning looks like we will move towards a national system. So not going back to the system of local lockdowns that have built up over a number of weeks. Uh, they've, they've genuinely played their part. They have helped to suppress the virus in those areas. We would be in a much worse position if we hadn't taken those actions. But because more and more parts of Wales needed to become subject to local measures, we ended up with a bit of a complicated uh, system, and I think the feeling is we would be better with a simpler national set of rules, which are the same everywhere you go. It doesn't mean that there won't sometimes be a need for local action as well. If we get flare-ups, if you remember right back in the beginning, probably the first example we had was a factory in Anglesey, where there was a big outbreak and lots of people working in the factory were affected. So you can imagine that, you know, if something like that happened in a local area in future, we'd still need some local measures in place. But essentially, I think we're heading to a simpler national set of rules, the same wherever you live. I appreciate these conversations haven't concluded yet. So I know you can't go into too much details, but I am going to ask Brendan for some more details if you can. Um, is Could there be restrictions on, on travel still? Um, will there be social bubbles? Is there anything you can give us just for some insight going forward? Yeah, of course. Um, well, many of the things that people have not been able to do in these uh, two weeks, we plan to restore, as we said we would. So my anticipation is, is that shops that are closed at the moment will be able to reopen, uh, that restaurants and bars and cafes will be able to reopen, uh, that gyms and leisure centres will be able to reopen, uh, essentially on the same terms uh, as they traded before the lockdown uh, began. Uh, two of the issues that are the trickiest to resolve and where we are still 
having you know discussions between cabinet colleagues but i've spent most of my day in meetings talking to other people about these things the first and the most difficult is household gatherings. What will we be able to offer people in terms of getting together uh, inside their own homes? And then the second issue is travel. Uh, what will we be able to do to allow people to travel uh, between different parts of Wales after the 9th of November? And on both of those, there's a lot of discussion still to be had, but I'm keen that we resolve it by the end of this week or the beginning of next to give people as much notice as we can of what will happen once the fire break period is over. I think one thing a lot of people are asking is, is it going to be different this time around? Or is it just a matter of time before eventually we're going to have to go back into another fire break? Do you think that's the most likely or is there a chance this could be the strongest restrictions we're going to see now in Wales? Well, look, I don't think it's inevitable that we will see another period like this. But nor could I say you, to you today that we're bound to escape it. I don't think it's inevitable because, you know, this firebreak period will make a difference. The way we all behave afterwards will make a difference. And there will be some things uh, that we just don't know about today, which will emerge over the weeks ahead. So let me give you just one example of that. We know that there are tests that are, you know, um, they're not licensed yet, but they are well on their way to being licensed. That will be very different to the sorts of tests we have at the moment. So at the moment, as you know, you've got to travel somewhere generally. A test is taken, it's sent off to a laboratory, it takes time for it to come back. There are tests in preparation, which will be much more like the sort of instant test you get in through a pregnancy test, for example, which you'll be able to use at home, uh, get the result very quickly. Now, if the other side of Christmas, some of those tests have genuinely broken through uh, and we're able to use them, then I think that will change the landscape as well, because we will be able to allow people to do things that we can't allow them to do today, because you'll be able to test yourself there and then and know whether it's safe for you to, to take part. So I don't want to give people the sense that, you know, it's all inevitably going to go wrong again. Winter is going to be very challenging. And I can't rule out that things will get difficult, but it isn't inevitable. And there are other things happening that could change the picture in quite radical ways. So not inevitable, but certainly possible. Uh, another five break lockdown. OK. Um, can you talk us through your thinking for restrictions over Christmas? At the moment, even the most dedicated and ardent followers of the rules are fatigued and many people are lonely and isolated. And all they want to do is know they can see their family. Is there a danger that if the rules are too strict, people will just break them? Um, have you considered publishing just guidelines over that period and leaving it to people to act responsibly? Um, or is Christmas just another day with regard to the rules, do you think? Well, first of all, you know, our ambition for this firebreak period is that it gets us through to Christmas so that we don't have to repeat this, this severity of restriction uh, in the weeks that lie ahead up to Christmas. For the Christmas period, uh, I myself am a firm believer in a UK-wide approach. I know this has been in the news a bit today, but you know, I, I've lost count of the number of times I have said that I wished we had more regular meetings with UK uh, ministers, and I really want to have an early meeting with them and with the First Ministers of Scotland and Northern Ireland, because you know, so many of us have family that lie on the other side of uh, the border, who normally we would visit and see over Christmas. Uh, and I think having a common set of rules, whatever the rules turn out to be, uh, will that apply right across the United Kingdom, and certainly between England and Wales, uh, I think will be the way that I would want to, you know, think through what we can manage over Christmas. Uh, so and then I think it'll be one set of rules for everybody, wherever you live, and I think that will be fair to people and easiest to communicate to people as well. So even if this fire break is incredibly successful, Wales uh, manages to um, repress the virus significantly. England has much higher rates. Would you still want to have that joined up um, approach to it? Do you still think that would be important? I still want to have a common set of rules. That doesn't common set of rules doesn't ne necessarily mean that anywhere anyone can go anywhere. 
but they will be the same rules for Wales and England. And that is because, you know, going back to your very first point, Christmas is a time when people want to meet up with the people that they know best and love most. Uh, and with our porous border, so many families uh, have people who live on either side. And I don't think it will make it easy for people if there's one set of rules in one part of the United Kingdom and a different set of rules somewhere else. Now, what those rules will be, would be for a matter for negotiation and discussion and advice from our chief medical officers and so okay. on. But my thinking um, about this is to try and reach a common position. OK. Um, just to kind of almost yes or no on this, because it will kind of follow on from that. Um, are the UK government lighthouse labs back performing at the level you would expect them to be at now after uh, a few months of issues? No. OK. Um, a month ago, on September the 27th, you told me that you'd had a conversation with the UK government where they assured you that in November we'd be getting 10,000 more tests a day than we were getting at the time. That clearly hasn't happened. Um, although these are UK government run labs, ultimately testing in Wales is down to the Welsh government. Are you going to take more testing into Wales now and stop relying on these lighthouse labs, given that they're not at the stage you want them to be? Uh, well, it's important to distinguish between two things. So there is the number of tests, and actually the number of tests is going up, and we will get, we think, that extra number through the Lighthouse Labs. Okay, so my when I said no to you, it wasn't because I was worrying about getting the extra number of tests. My anxiety with the Lighthouse Labs is, is that they are not yet back to where they were in terms of turnaround times. So it's not that... It's not that we are short of tests. Uh, for the last two weeks, we've had more tests available in Wales than people have wanted to use. Uh, where the Lighthouse Labs are not yet back to where they need to be is in turning those tests round within 24 hours. Uh, and that's why, I, that's why I gave you the answer that I did. Uh, we are increasing the number of tests available within the Welsh system. And where we need a swift response we are putting more Welsh tests into that part of the system. Not every test needs to be back in 24 hours. Quite a lot of the tests we do are what are called surveillance tests, uh, where you're not testing people who are ill, you're just looking for how much coronavirus is around. Okay. You know, if those come back in 48 hours or even three days, it doesn't really matter so much. Okay. We're putting Welsh tests into the part of the system where speed is important. OK, um, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to try and whiz for a few of these. I know I'm asking you for quick answers to complicated questions, but um, Tina on Twitter uh, was one of many people who asked about shielding. Um, for months, shielded people were told not to leave their homes. Now cases are high and it's told it's up to their discretion. Why is there a difference now? And um, what is the chance that shielding will be reinstated for people this winter? Uh, well, shielding was important at the time, but it came with harms as well as helps. So for lots of people, particularly people living on their own, told not to leave the home at all, not to go out for exercise and so on, it caused other sorts of harms. Uh, our chief medical officer feels that people will have learnt from that experience. There still are lots of people who are very, very cautious and right to be so. But there are some people who were previously shielding who have found ways in which they can begin to play a part in the world again and he is anxious not to put new barriers in their path. So it's not discretion in the sense of shrugging our shoulders and say, oh, it's up to you. Chief Medical Officer is writing to everybody on the shielding list this week, giving them fresh advice, the best advice we can, but then saying to people, you probably are the best judge in your own individual circumstances of how much risk you feel you can manage and how safely you can manage that risk. So. Um, I think lots of people on the shielding list continue to live pretty restricted lives, and they do that because their underlying health conditions are serious. But we didn't want a blanket ban that applied to everybody when we think people are well-placed and can get advice from their own GP, for example, if they need it, as, as to how they can interpret that advice in their own circumstances. OK, uh, I want to ask you about hospital transmission. Um, we know that other than care homes, transmission in hospital is probably the most dangerous in terms of more deaths. Um, given the hospitals have had plenty of notice since the summer and there's plenty of PPE, how can hospital transmission still be happening? Are 
procedures not being followed or um, are the procedures not enough? Um, how, how is coronavirus still spreading in our hospitals? Well, look, I, I'm afraid, I think the truth is, is that no matter how hard you work and no matter how much PPE you have and so on, uh, in a hospital environment, there is an irreducible minimum below which you cannot eliminate coronavirus. So I'll give you just one actual example that was conveyed to me by uh, somebody working in an A&E department in a Welsh hospital. Uh, and, you know, the, the rules generally are people are tested on arrival and all of that. Somebody arrived, they were in the middle of a heart attack. Uh, they had to be taken there and then to the cardiac unit in order to save their life. There was no time to test. There was no time to do all the things that you would expect to see done. Otherwise, that person was not going to survive. Uh, that is what they did. And it turned out that that person had coronavirus. And they had inevitably come into contact with some other people who hadn't. Now, those are the, you know, the day in, day out decisions that are made by our clinicians with weighing up the different sorts of risks uh, that they face. And in all of that, you know, try as you might. And I can tell you our staff try as hard as they can to do the to do everything to eliminate coronavirus. There are some there are some instances when it will not be possible. And this is a virus that once it is spread, once it's out and it's moving, it is, you know, it's um it's very hard indeed sometimes to get it back under control. Um, yeah, I don't think anyone would doubt the uh, efforts of our health service um, in containing. Um, uh, I want to ask you about Vietnam, which is a country of 93 million people, and that's only had 35 deaths in 2020. Um, in Wales, we had 37 deaths announced just today. Can you explain why have some countries performed so much better than us? Well, I think in some instances, and I think Vietnam is one, it, it's culture. Uh, isn't it? It's the extent to which uh, people are prepared to follow uh, to the letter rules that governments lay down. Uh, so I have a feeling that, um, that there were there was a very different reaction in Wales to uh, the sale of or the non-sale of non-essential goods than they would have been in Vietnam. Because Vietnam is a society in which, you know, the government sets the rules and people stick by them. So it's, it's you know, it's a, we have a different sort of society, a society with a good deal more freedom where we expect, and I think quite rightly, uh, to live our lives uh, without interference as much as possible. And that brings risks with it, but it brings huge rewards with, with it as well. And different countries have different cultures and weigh up risks in different ways. Uh, the next question, I think I, I probably know your answer. Um, this was asked on Twitter by about 500 people. Uh, mm -hmm. We had a lot of questions about the constitutional settlement in the UK. Um, has the um, crisis changed your view on the UK constitution? Has it made you a little bit indie curious? Um, look, genuinely, m my conclusion from uh, the whole experience is, is that we have the best of both worlds. So we have a strong devolution settlement. I think it should be stronger. Uh, but we have a devolution settlement that has allowed us to take our own decisions in the way that we want to take them. And I think that has been to the huge benefit of Wales. Okay. Uh, but if we were on our own, then all the money that we have had to help people who are furloughed, people who are self-employed, to support our businesses, we would never have had that had we been on our own. Uh, we would never have had access to the sort of scientific advice that we have by being part of the United Kingdom. We would never have been able to mobilize the response we have had uh, in you know, looking for a vaccine for the future and so on. So I think what the crisis has demonstrated to me is that having you know, a, a devolution settlement in which we are assertive about the rights we have and our ability to make decisions for ourselves, but we're still able to draw on the resources and the experience that comes of being part of a larger whole is to our advantage. Okay. Um, I, anyone who looks on social media can see there's a lot of misinformation, disinformation, and conspiracy theories uh, about coronavirus. 
How much harder do they does that make it for you to control the virus? And are there any examples that you've seen that jump out at you? Well, I'm afraid they do make it more difficult to control the virus because this is a virus where if even a small minority of people deliberately flout the rules, that poses enormous risks to everybody else. I'm afraid we have seen examples of people who are badly misled, I'm afraid, by some of the sort of theories, uh, Will, that you say are in circulation. And the most dangerous ones of all are the ones that try to persuade people that coronavirus is just a mild form of illness. Most people get better very quickly. It's just like a bout of the flu or less. You shouldn't be afraid of it. All of that sort of stuff that encourages people to minimise the risks and then encourages people to behave in ways that poses risks to themselves uh, and others. You know, we've had the sad business today of announcing 37 deaths. Uh, this is a deadly virus. It attacks all sorts of people. It doesn't just attack older people. It doesn't just attack people who've got underlying health conditions. It can attack anybody and its impact in people's lives, not just people who you know, die as a result of it, but all those people who are left with that long aftermath, people whose lives don't just get back on track quickly, but for months and months, people are not well, feel the impact of the disease, you know, the worst sort uh, of trickery, I think, is to pretend to people that this is not a serious illness where we've all got a part to play. We're um, we're actually going to have um, Health Minister Vaughan Geffen on next week to debunk some of these. If people who are watching do want to tune in next week, they will be able to see that. Um, I'm very conscious of time, so I'm going to do some quick fire ones. So kind of one sentence okay. answers. Would, be great. Yeah. Um, would you consider increasing the numbers of people that are allowed at weddings? Uh, not at the present. OK. Um, how did you react when you saw people ripping down barriers in supermarkets? Um, well, I, I suppose I was very disappointed uh, and uh, puzzled uh, that people would feel that uh, shopping was more important than protecting people's health. Um, why did you include gyms in the fire break, given their impact on physical and mental health? Because there is evidence from around the world that uh, gyms can spread coronavirus because of when people are exercising, the way we breathe out. And gyms have been super spreader places in some parts of the world, but also because during the fire break period, every little helps. OK, uh, this one uh, question actually comes from um, Carmarthen Town Football Club. Um, uh, so their um, uh, semi-professional teams, so in tier one, um, are able to play, but any tier below that are not. Um, the rule is uh, a 30 person maximum prohibits them from playing. If that was to be raised to 50 or it, football was made exempt, all of these clubs, which are central part of their communities, would be able to come back. Um, clubs with tier two facilities actually are just as COVID safe as tier one. And the Women's Premier League are actually playing in tier two settings. In a long winded question, would you consider allowing more football clubs to return or sports clubs generally? Uh this is one of the things we genu genuinely keep under review all the time. And I'm very well, very aware of those clubs who play, who are based in Wales, but play in leagues across uh, borders and trying to make sure the Welsh clubs are not disadvantaged. I've watched quite a lot of Kamal in town in Richmond Park, uh, so I can uh, picture them now. So, look, I, I can't say that the rules are going to be changed immediately, but it is one of those issues that we constantly keep under review. OK, uh We've had a version of this question in lots of forms, but I, I, I'll put it to you like this. Why can I get on a plane which is packed with people, but I'm not allowed to go to a theatre? Um, well, uh, it's a combination of different things. My own view is uh, to say to people, uh, I wouldn't get on a plane unless you really need to, uh, because travelling is one of the ways in which we know coronavirus is brought back to Wales and played a quite a large part in the outbreaks we saw at the beginning of September. Uh, so I don't think my suggestion to people is, you know, go and travel and be on a plane. It's to do with the length of time the people uh, are there. It's to do with the nature of the business, you know, and travel is unavoidable for some people. Going to the theatre is avoidable for us all. Okay. Uh, 
I mean, no, we're, we're coming to time now. So the final question I just want to ask you, First Minister, is you've mentioned that your wife and mother both had the virus. Um, are they both OK now? Have they recovered? Yes, thank you very much. It's my mother-in-law, uh, in fact, who lives uh, with us. And uh, they both were uh, quite ill for a few days uh, earlier in the year. But uh, hopefully now that is all behind them. OK, thank you um, very much, First Minister. I know that was a bit of a, a whistle-stop tour. There's a lot more we'd have, uh, like to have got into, but we'd um, love to invite you if you'd like to come back in the next uh, few weeks or so. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, happy to do that, Will. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you very much. Take care. Um, that's all we've got time for, but we're hoping to do a lot more of these in the future. Um, if you'd like to send us your feedback in the comments, um, please do be gentle. Um, next week, we're going to have Health Minister Vaughan Gething, who's going to be talking about conspiracy theories. And we're going to be working to debunk some of the biggest misconceptions around the virus. Um, so hope to see you all next Wednesday. And thank you very much for tuning in and please stay safe.